Good morning. Is this not a beautiful day that God has given us? And we are here gathered in this place, and we want to celebrate that, and so I'm going to invite us to start our singing, and I'm going to actually look at the bulletin so I know what it is we are singing. We're going to start with 2166, Christ Beside Me. And like we did last week, we're just going to sing verses 1 and 2. Christ Beside Me. And again, you can feel free to stand, sit, um, dance, whatever you feel called to do. 2166. Next one will be 2023, How Majestic Is Your Name, and we'll just sing that through two times. Actually, we'll sing it through once. But good morning again. I welcome you and I greet you in the name and the grace and the peace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It's good to have you here this morning. For those of you worshiping at home with us, we're glad you're part of this service as well and pray that the service touches your heart in some very real and powerful way. As we get started, I have a couple announcements to make. Um, first of all, tomorrow being a holiday, the office will be closed. So if you need to talk to Sue or me, you won't find either of us here. So check us on Tuesday. 
Uh, also, a week from this coming uh, Wednesday, we start our next Bible study, which is called Acts, Catching Up with the Spirit. The books are out in the library if you'd like one. Uh, as always, we ask for a $12 donation to offset the cost, but do not let that stop you. Um, uh, I'd rather have you at the study than have your $12. Don't worry about that. Uh, this study, we are hoping, given the way things are going, uh, we're going to be offering what I'm going to call a hybrid way to meet those who like to meet in person. Uh, I will be here. We can gather in the Yates room and we can worship together or, and study together. Those who are more comfortable doing it from Zoom will have a Zoom link as well, so we'll all be together in some way, shape, or form. So Acts, a week from this coming Wednesday. And then I need to take a moment. You have heard a lot about the fall festival coming on October 31st. Well, it is coming rapidly. It's here in three weeks, uh, and I am really excited about that. It, it, there's, there are flyers out in the library uh, for you to hand out. There's also some glossy ones that we're asking if, if, if you're going to be by one of the grocery stores or someplace that has a community bulletin board, take one of the glossies, take it and tack it up there for us. Part of this is an outreach to the community. We want folks to know that Hazardville United Methodist Church is open and alive and we are doing great stuff and it's a great place to be. We are going to have some amazing things going on uh, at this event. There is going to be some great food. Robbie Neiman is, uh, is catering for us. We're going to have a cupcake food truck out front for, for our dessert. Uh, we're inviting anybody in the neighborhood to come by to get you know cupcake, get food, to join us. We are going to have tons of games for kids uh, and some games for the adults as well. Uh, we're going to have face painting. We're planning and hoping to have pumpkin painting for those who want it. And I've been told reliably that the face painting is not just for the kids. It's for the adults too, yes, yes. Um, and if you want to make sure yours looks really nice, the face painter is sitting down front. You can bribe her after the service. <laughs> um, we also are going to have a train ride here. There is a, uh, a train that comes. It's got several cars. They are rather big, enough for it to sit two to, two to four kids, I think, per car. Uh, and it's going to travel all over the grass, the macadam, all over. I mean, we're going to give train rides to the kids, and I think we can fit some adults in there, too. It's going to be a ball. We're going to have some live music here. Um, this is going to be fantastic. I am really excited. I mean, I know I'm, I don't show my emotions well, but I really am excited. Out in the library, there's a couple sign-up sheets. We are going to need help Saturday doing some of the preliminary setup. We're going to need help Sunday morning before church to complete the setup. Uh, we're going to need some help Sunday after it's over to help tear it down. We also, as part of this, uh, we've done trunk or treat in the past, and I know when we've done that, we've had some of the cars in the back, and we use some of the rooms downstairs. We're trying to keep everything focused up front here so people don't have to leave and go down and sit by their car and miss out on all the other fun that's going on. So we're turning the upstairs office space area into our own version of trunk or treat. We're going to decorate the rooms, the doors. There's a little map. Now, if you've ever come to a Bible study, you know that my one and only rule is you may not poke fun at the teacher's spelling. We're invoking a second rule here. You may not poke fun at the pastor's artwork. There is a, a, a drawing of the floor plan with the rooms labeled. Uh, if you'd like to have a door, a door that you can decorate uh, and hand out, you know, be in costume and hand out uh, trick-or-treats to the kids, uh, candy or whatever, sign up and claim those rooms, first come, first serve. Um, we are going to be having Halloween costume contests for adults and kids with prizes. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah, we got, we got somebody excited already. So there's good stuff. So please, grab some flyers. Hand them out to friends, neighbors, family, coworkers, whatever. Take some of the glossies. Get them posted up around town. Sign up to, to help. Sign up to uh, uh, do one of the rooms and hand stuff out. And plan to come. Spread the word. This is going to be a ball. And this is going to let the world know that Hazardville United Methodist Church is alive. We're fun. We're vibrant. And we're open for business. Can I get an amen on that? All right. You know, you really do need to give him some sugar in the morning so he gets a little enthusiastic. <laughs> Again, welcome. It is good to gather, to worship and praise God for all of God's blessings. 
And as we turn our hearts and minds now to an attitude of thanksgiving and praise, let's start by inviting God into our lives. Let's pray. Gracious God, we have gathered. We are here to praise you, to worship you. And we just ask you to fill this space and fill our hearts, whether we're in this room, whether we're in our living rooms, wherever we are. Fill us and draw us together with you. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our opening hymn you'll find in the hymnal, it's number 568, Christ for the World We Sing. Let's stand, let's sing. first reading this morning comes to us from the book of Job, from the second chapter. Hear, hear these words. Now when Job's three friends heard of all his troubles and everything that had come upon him, each of them set out from his home. Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Namathite. They met together to go and console and comfort him. When they saw him from a distance, they did not recognize him, and they raised their voices and wept aloud. They tore their robes and threw dust in the air upon their heads. They sat with him on the ground seven days and seven nights. No one spoke a word to him, for they saw that his suffering was very great. I want to invite the kids to come on down and join me. How you guys doing? Good. You gonna come over? Oh, that's good. That's good. Yeah, come on over. Hey, do you guys know what this is, or what it's supposed to be? What? It's a garbage can. Yeah, it's it's a little trash tipper. Um, somebody was nice enough to give this to me after the thing hit me in the face to remind me how to actually use them, and I'm so grateful for that. 
<laughs> but yeah, this is a garbage can. What do you put in it? Garbage. Garbage. Yeah, that's sort of a, a no-brainer. And it's probably recycling. Yeah, but you know, I was out, I was out the other day, and I came by, and, it's, and that was just laying on the ground. It's garbage. So, no, it's not bubble wrap. It's garbage. So, is it okay to just throw garbage? I mean, I don't have to fill this up, do I? I mean, is it all right to have garbage just laying around places? I mean, no. It's not hurting anybody. It's just sitting there. called littering, and it's illegal. It, it is. It's 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 illegal. And it's, and, it's, and it's not good. Do you think God likes it when we litter? No. no, I mean, God gave us a pretty cool looking world, didn't he? Well, I, you know, I never thought to light it on fire and watch it blow up. I think I'll just pick it up and stuff it in my trash can. How's that? You know, God gave us a beautiful world. I mean, the flowers and the trees and the grass and the nice blue. You know, do you think God likes when we litter? Well, what, what, can we, what can we do about that? Yeah, some, we can pick it up. Now, sometimes you've got to be careful because you don't want to just be touching everything there. But, yeah, we, we need to, well, we can. We, we need to pick up some litter. And what about when we have litter to get rid of in garbage? Yeah, what, do you, what, what should we do with ours? Should we just throw it there for somebody else to pick up? No, what do you do with it? You, you, put it? you put it in where it goes, in a, in a garbage can. In the right place. Put it in the right place. There you go, it goes in the trash or the recycling. And on that note, we're going to pray for once. The train left the station, the train arrived in the station. We're going to pray. That it crushes it to death. Let's pray. God, you've given us such a beautiful world. Forgive us when we just throw stuff away and, and litter and throw our garbage around. Help us to do whatever we can do to help make your world, the world you gave us, as beautiful as we can. Because each time we do that, we're saying thank you to you for the gift you've given us. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you.
gracious God, we offer these, our tithes, our gifts, our offerings to you, in gratitude and love and devotion, in response to the love and the blessings you pour out upon us. Take these gifts, Lord. Bless them and multiply them and use them that your love might be shared beyond the reaches of these walls so that everyone might know how much you love us, all of us. Amen. Please be seated. As we come to our time of joys and concerns, I have several of each, um, and I'm going to start with the, the joy. We've been praying for Jeff Mosher for some time now as he deals with the aftermath of his experience with COVID. He is still not good, but he is off the ventilator. Uh, he is uh, becoming aware of his surroundings and able to respond. Uh, it is a small step forward, but it is, praise God, a step forward, and we continue to lift him up uh, and the whole family, and we thank God for the progress. We continue to pray for progress. Um, we want to keep the Bissells in our prayer. Little Hannah spent a couple days in the hospital this week. Uh, she had a severe fever. She had some respiratory issues. It is not COVID. They were able to definitively rule that out. They don't know what caused it. Uh, they were able to bring the fever back under control, and she is back home now. Um, and I haven't gotten any notice that they've had to take her back, so that was a good sign because the first 24 hours is the time they were most concerned about. So uh, let's, con let's hold Hannah and uh, in our prayers, Jen and Nick as well, as they deal with, with that. I want to keep uh, Robert Tarver, Tracy's dad, in our prayers. He's having surgery this week to repair uh, his rotator cuff and uh, to reattach the muscles and tendons in his good arm. So um, we want to keep that uh, in prayers. Um, we want to keep Joe and Nicole in our prayers uh, as they go through some tough times right now and as they're struggling to figure out how that all works. Yes. Oh, and his brother too, I forgot, so thank you. Your stepfather is having surgery this week for, I'm sorry, you said, for a mass on his right lung. So we want to keep Joe's stepdad in our prayers. His brother was also, Joe's brother was also in a car accident this past week. He ended up with a broken leg, if I remember hearing correctly, but otherwise is okay. And so we want to hold that in our prayers. So for a cousin who's, who's passed, uh, whose father passed, and, and for an aunt with dealing with COVID. So they've got a lot on their plate. So if, if you could hold them in, in your prayers. There's also one, and I've saved this to last because it's one I really don't want to lift up, but need to. Yesterday, Kelly Versteeg suffered a massive stroke. Um, they performed emergency surgery. They brought her up to Hartford. Uh, in talking with Linda this morning, they are making some tough decisions. There is no brain activity. Um, that leaves Julia and Ava facing the prospects of losing their mom. Please keep them in prayer. Please keep them in prayer. This is a nightmare scenario, and they could use all the prayers we can muster. Go ahead, Jer. I have uh, three. I have a joy from Sue Fricasso that Pete's cousin Kenny received a life-saving liver transplant thanks to an organ donor. And she asked for prayers for his recovery and for the family of the organ donor. And then uh, Patrice Carson has, is asking for prayers for a good friend, Steve, who passed away in August. And then a personal joy of mine, uh, my brother Joe got married uh, on Friday. All right, so, so uh, for, the, for the blessing of organ transplants, uh, for weddings, 
and for family who is also dealing with the loss of a loved one. We need to pray. Let's pray. Lord, when the burdens weigh on our hearts so heavily, when we say goodbye to mothers, husbands, cousins, and the hole they leave in our lives, when we face the uncertainty of not knowing what will come out of surgeries and visits to the hospital, even minor visits, it's so hard to stand sometimes. But then we are reminded that you do work in our lives, even in tragedies, and progress is made, and healing begins to take place, and love still blossoms, and weddings still happen. Lord, you have heard all that we've lifted up. You know the pain we feel for those we care for, and you know the pain they are experiencing. Lord, we need strength and courage for these days. And people we care about need comfort and hope and healing. That calm assurance that the sun does come out tomorrow. Be our harbor in the storm, O oh Lord. Be the solid rock upon which we can stand, the anchor that we can hold to. Because you're always the wind beneath our wings. But we need that harbor right about now. And we know you hear our prayers. We know you answer our prayers because even before we knew we needed him. You sent your son, Jesus Christ, into this world. And it's in his name we offer this prayer. And the prayer that he taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our next hymn is number 402. Lord, I want to be a Christian. Let's stand and let's sing.
Pray with me, would you? Lord, we turn to your word so that we might learn to be more like Jesus. That we might be more loving in our hearts. Open us and pour your word in. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Many of you know I'm a big fan of the Peanuts gang. Charlie Brown and Linus and Lucy and the whole, the whole gang. And I always think of him this time of year because we're getting close to Halloween. And Charlie Brown always had mixed feelings about trick-or-treating. Because he didn't have a lot of luck. He and his friends would walk up to a house. They would knock on the door, the door would open, and they'd yell, trick or treat, and they'd hold out their little bags, and the people would drop stuff on them. The kids would run down to the, to the curb, and they'd look, I got a cookie, I got a pack of gum, oh, 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 I got brownie. Charlie Brown was, I got a rock. Every house, it was the same, I got this, I got that, there was excitement, and Charlie Brown saying, I got a rock. There's a lot of Christians, I think, that can relate to that. Because for a lot of Christians, it feels like life just dumps rocks upon us. Christians for the last five, ten years or so have bemoaned the fact that we live and are being persecuted within our own country. You hear it every year during the Christmas holiday season when some innocent clerk wishes you a happy holiday instead of Merry Christmas. Oh, they're trying to take Christ out of Christmas, we hear. They're trying to do away with, with our faith, we hear. We're under attack, we hear. I got a rock, we hear. You hear it when a bakery is told they must bake a cake for everyone, even two men or two women. Oh, you're forcing us to do things we don't believe in is the cry. You're, 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 you're trying to go against God. You're making us go against God. You're, you're, you're making us do something evil baking this particular cake. I got a rock, they cry. It's the same when clerks won't issue licenses, marriage licenses for the same weddings or, or pharmacists won't dispense birth control or, or people won't get a simple vaccine to keep others safe. It's not God's way, you hear. And I can only do that which is God's way. It doesn't matter what I promise to do. You're trying to make me do what I don't believe. My faith, I'm being persecuted. I'm, you're, 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 you're standing against me. Never mind the fact that we live in a country where not everyone is a Christian. That there are different beliefs, different lifestyles. Never mind that when we take on a, a particular job, we say we will do this and serve everybody because in our faith, discriminating against anybody for any reason stands against what Jesus has taught us. But still the cry goes out. We're being persecuted. You're trying to tear down our faith. Now to be fair, there are people in this world who stand against what we believe in actively, who don't like our message, who do not like our God because they don't believe in it and so they don't think anybody else should either. There are also those who don't believe because sometimes they look at those who claim the name Christian and we don't always live what we claim on a Sunday morning, do we? And it begs the question then, is the problem sometimes not that the opposition to Christ's message is out there, but sometimes the problem is dare I say, in here. And I don't mean this church small c, I mean a church big c. Are we sometimes the problem? Well, fortunately for us, Mark is serving up a special sandwich this week that helps us deal with that. And I want to take a look at that sandwich because I think Mark had this sort of question, this sort of battle, this 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 torment in mind when he served it up. So hear these words from the gospel according to Mark. And Jesus went home and the crowd came together again so that they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, 
They went out to restrain him, for people were saying he has gone out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, He has Beelzebub, and by the ruler of demons he casts out demons. And he called them to him and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but his end has come. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first tying up the strong men. Then indeed the house can be plundered. Truly I tell you, people will be forgiven for their sins and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit can never be forgiven, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they had said, he has an unclean spirit. Then his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers and sisters are outside asking for you. And he replied, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and my mother. Amen. Mark has given us an, an incredible sandwich to chew on here. There's a lot of stuff in there. I mean, it's got everything, doesn't it? It's got the crowd. It's got the disciples. It's got his family. It's got, it's got those, those standard villains, the scribes and the Pharisees. I mean, they're all in this story. And there's a lot happening. So why don't we peel it back and take a look at how this sandwich is concocted and kind of get an understanding of what Mark is trying to say to us. And we start with the crowd. The crowd is pressing in. There's so many people that they're trying to eat, and they can't, Jesus can't even eat. There's so many people. There's his disciples, of course, and they're getting squeezed as well. And on the outside fringes of, of the crowd are the bad guys, the scribes and the Pharisees. They're not really being a threat to Jesus. They're, they're just there to mock and to ridicule, to argue, to try and undermine his, his ministry. But they're no real threat. The real threat to Jesus that starts to develop early on, the folks who are seeking to restrain or redirect him and, and change what's going on, is his family. They have come because they've been told he's going out of his mind, and so they come to save him from himself. They try to pull him out of what he's doing because they don't think what he's doing is good. So on that piece of bread, that there's already some opposition, not from without, but from within, then we start to get the meat on it. And Mark turns his attention to those villains, those scribes, and those Pharisees. Because, you know, there's an old saying, or an old story of a guy who was giving a speech. And he was being heckled rather badly. And finally, in frustration, he looked at the heckler and said, excuse me, if you don't mind, if I had won it this hard of a time, I could have stayed home and talked to my kids. Jesus doesn't even have to go home to talk to his kids. The, the family came looking for him. And in the midst of that, you've got the bad guys, the scribes and the Pharisees, who want to tear down what he's doing. And so what they do is something that's really rather ingenious. They've learned they can't argue the fine points of Scripture with them because every time they do, Jesus hands them their head, basically. So they employ an age-old tactic. They level a charge out there. Oh, he's got the demon in him. He does this by Beelzebub. He does this by Satan. And it's marvelous, isn't it? Because, I mean, how can you prove that that's how he's doing it? They don't have to prove, do they? That's where gossip and innuendo are so powerful. It's up to Jesus to prove that they're wrong. And how do you prove you don't have a demon in you? You can't. They have set the perfect trap. But we've learned something, haven't we, 
with Jesus. Every time they set a perfect trap, who gets stuck in the trap? They do. And so Jesus answers back with a rhetorical question. He says, well, you know, a house divided can't stand. It falls on itself. So if, if it's Satan driving out Satan, then his house is already divided. His kingdom's already come to an end. He has no power. But if I do it by the power of God, then is that what you're saying, that I'm doing this by God? Or are you saying that a non-existent power is doing it because he's already fallen? Which is it? And at that point, they're stuck. Because if they say, well, it's by the non-existent power, then, well, they got nowhere to go. And if they say, well, you're doing it by God, well, <laughs> they have nowhere to go. But they tried awful hard, didn't bless, bless their hearts, as they might say down south. Bless their hearts. They tried. But we're not done yet because we come back to the other piece of bread, which is the family again. And the family has come either to save Jesus from himself, to save him from public ridicule, maybe to save it from their own embarrassment. And they send word in, go tell Jesus we're here. Come on out to us. But Jesus knows what they're after. He knows what their intentions are. And so Jesus out of frustration maybe, maybe out of disappointment, recrafts and redefines what makes up a family. He said, family, he said, my family's not flesh and blood. My family is not some ancestral tree. My family, my family is those who do God's will. He said, you don't have to be born of the same parents that I am to be my family. You don't have to share that. My family are those who do God's will. That's an amazing answer. And I want you, as we've concocted this and now have this sandwich, I want you to look at a few things that are important. And the first thing I want you to notice is who it is that Jesus loses patience with and who he is really intolerant of. I mean, now again, think of who is there. There is the crowd. And crowd is Mark speak for the undesirables, the poor, the sinner, the outcast, the ones who don't go to church or synagogue on a regular basis, the one that the good holy people turn their back on because they don't like to look at them or even acknowledge them. The crowd is there. His disciples are there. The, the scribes and the Pharisees are there trying to stir up things as they try to do. And his family, his mother, his brother, his sisters are there. And who is it Jesus loses patience with? It's not the crowd. Even those who aren't are Jewish, even those who aren't really committed to following him, he doesn't lose patience with them. It's the scribes and the Pharisees and his family. Because they have tried to restrain and redirect. They have tried to work against God's love and compassion and reconciliation. And he said, I have no time for you because what you're doing is of the devil, basically. So, Dave, does that mean you're saying the devil's real, Satan's real? Uh-huh, I am but not the cartoon devil we like to see, you know, with the little horns and the tail and the pitchfork. When Jesus talks about Satan, he's talking about a demonic force that it works against God's will. He's talking about a demonic force that continues to try and entice us away from God into looking into our own comfort and our own power, our own wealth, our own prestige. It's, it's that demonic power that plays to all of our basis instincts on, on race, materialism, patriarchy, homophobia, you name it. If it hurts anybody, it wants us because all it cares about is hurting as many people as it can. And that's why he says, you know, there's, there is a sin. You know, the, these people who, who are, are blaspheming the Holy Spirit, it's an eternal sin because what they're really saying is you're not doing this by the power of God. You're doing this by the power of the devil. And they are saying that God's will, God's spirit is evil. You know, there's, there's an old story. 
There's an old story about a father who was getting ready to go to work. He was in the bathroom getting ready. He was brushing his teeth. And all of a sudden, the door bursts open and in comes his seven-year-old daughter. Unannounced, not knocking. And she looks at him and says, Aha! It's you! You're the one who keeps putting the tube, or the, the cat back on the toothpaste. I gotta tell you, I get that feeling as I read this particular story, this deal with this particular Mark sandwich. Because it's sort of like he's letting us know we're the ones who keep putting the cap back on the toothpaste of, 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 God's, of God's work. I mean, think about it. It's not a holiday greeting that undermines the work of, of, of God. It's not a cake that undermines the work of God. It's not a marriage license or a prescription or, or anything else that undermines the work of God. What undermines the work of God is when the people of God start asking the questions, instead of asking, what would Jesus have me do? Starts asking the question, what can I make Jesus do for me? And when we do that, we fall into all sorts of problems. Because we end up becoming the problem. Not the folks out there, but the folks in here. I mean, there's an old adage, an old African proverb that says, when bull elephants fight, the grass always loses. Well, how many times have we in the church been the bull elephants, fighting over theology and liturgy and who to include and who to exclude? trampling all over the grass, the people out there who desperately need the message of God's love. But instead, all they see is the folks preaching love fighting amongst themselves. The problem is not a holiday greeting. The problem is not a cake. Or allowing people to live a lifestyle that is not really what we would live or even agree with. But understanding they have the right to make that choice. The problem is when we get those questions confused and instead of asking, Jesus, what would you have me do? Start asking, Jesus, what can I make you do? And all Mark is asking us with this sandwich is which question are we asking? And how are we going to answer it? Pray with me. Lord, sometimes we are the biggest obstacle to your will. I'm too young, I'm too old, I'm too small. We've never done it that way before. We can't afford it. Nobody, nobody will come. We offer you reason after reason why we cannot do what you call us to do. And then we claim your name. Help us, Lord, to not just claim your name, but to live in such a way that if we never open our mouths, people we will know we belong to you. It's not about what you will do for us, Lord. It's about what you want us to do for you. Open our eyes. And help us see how we can be part of the solution instead of part of the problem. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 434, When the Poor Ones. I invite you to stand as you're able. Let's sing. Nothing 
share with strangers. When the thirsty water give unto us all, when the crippled in their weakness strengthen others, then we know that God still goes that road with When we love, though, hate at times seems all around us, then we know that God still goes that road with us. Then we know that God still goes that road with us. When our joy fills up our cup to overflowing when our lips can speak no words other than true when we know that love for simple things is better benediction. Uh, I was wondering if, if you all would mind helping me with a homework assignment I have. You know I'm taking this class to creating a culture of renewal and I have an exercise I need to do. It will take probably three to four minutes. That's all it is. It's not difficult, I promise. Uh, but if you could stay after the, uh, after the benediction, after Julie's postlude, for us to do that real quick, I would appreciate any help. If you can't stay or don't want to stay, that's cool. There's no problem. I'll get over the disappointment. But... <laughs> No, uh, if you can't stay or don't want to stay, that's okay. But if you can, I'd appreciate the help. As you go from this place, remember the question to ask. What would you have me do, Jesus? With each person you meet, with each situation you're in, what would you have me do, Jesus? And may the love and the peace and the grace and the strength of our Lord and Savior be with you this day and every day.